displays quantum effects. We know that there is also another way for the environment to mess up with us. And is populations may remain conserved, but there is the danger that the phase between different superpositions may be randomized. Well, is this type of noise the one that is going to be particularly relevant for us? Hmm? So think about what would you expect to happen in the steady state? Hmm? The argument of Many people will be, in particular the biologists, refusing to enroll in the recently offered quantum mechanics course would be fine. Maybe you have a lot of action at the beginning. Let me focus in, in, in a quantity that will be purely quantum mechanical. So this E of rho quantifies the quantum correlations, let's say, across one by partition, let's say, is two. If I call it qubits, everybody understands me. Okay, qubits, electrons, spins, whatever you want. So I draw an imaginary line in here, and here I'm just plotting what is the entanglement across that partition hmm? as a function of t. Okay. So then, if this is an open system, you may think, fine. Maybe at the beginning I have. At the beginning, I have a lot of action. I'm showing sure you the movie already. <laughs> Some oscillations and so, but probably if I look at sufficiently long times, all these quantum correlations will be gone. Yeah. And what happens in many cases, and the biologists will tell you, we told you. Okay? But this is not the case. Actually, the dynamics can be considerably more entertaining. And in particular, it can happen that you may have some action at the beginning, and then when you look at what is going on at very long times, quantum correlations may survive. And a typical situation for that to happen would be having your open quantum system in contact with two reservoirs. One would be driving the system, thermically even, yeah, and the other one is the mechanism you have for the noise being able to drive the density matrix probably to a steady state, in general, non-equilibrium steady state that contains quantum correlations. Hmm? So, when the system is not in equilibrium, it may be that entanglement survives forever. Yeah? This is the, I guess, side of cells, right? But nowadays, I would even argue that the effect is, at the beginning was a little bit of a rarity, and now it's starting to be ubiquitous. It has been observed, theoretically, in systems subject to a very different type of noise. So my argument is that in open quantum systems, you can have a non-trivial relation between entanglement and noise when you look at the steady state. And this is what I've tried to plot in here. If you quantify the amount of quantum correlations you hold in the steady state, whatever measure you want to use, and you plot it as a function of a parameter that characterizes the strength of the noise. Let us say the strength of the coupling to the surroundings, then you encounter this typical behavior. Yeah? There will be some region where the noise is such that it's not enough to sustain the quantum correlations and the strength is separable, but then you get a threshold value in here, and from then on, quantum correlations start to build up so that there is a critical value of the noise strength for which the entanglement that survives is the largest. If you continue making the system noisier and noisier, of course quantum correlations degrade. Yeah. What do you plot with the x-axis? 
In the x axis is a measure of the strength of the noise. So, for instance, in quantum optics, could be the spontaneous emission rate, right? So, let's say all the features specifically related with coupling strength, properties of the spectral density, etc., could be embedded in this. Okay? What is important to realize is that this is the entanglement content of the state that you reach. Say, hmm? If you pay attention only at what happens in the transient, yes. But, and you mean that this is a, it's not a, it's not a regular state? It's not, no. So you are driving the system or how, how are you? You are driving the system or Continuous. you can have some, sorry? Continuous. Continuous. Um, but you could also have um, pulse interaction. But indeed, you have to have a way to put energy into the system. It's crucial that you may be in, in, in the presence of some phase randomization, right? But if that is the only source of noise you have, then the steady state tends to be as maximally mixed. So here it's important that in a selected basis you have the possibility to couple longitudinally to the smart. Like no, I don't want to call this a classical resonance. No, because taking into account that this has been very misleading. I was telling Roberto today, and it was my blame, man, because I used that denomination in our 2008 paper simply because indeed it, it resembles that. But taking into account that here we are only putting the entanglement content. Of course, you can do is use an information theoretic measure, quantify the total amount of correlation using the mutual information. Well, there, indeed, the behavior as a function of the noise strength is non monotonic, and you could argue that if, if that measure is a good figure of merit, then the system is <coughs> very successful. Okay? So then the aim of of this introduction was to call your attention to this. Mm -hmm. That is not necessarily the case that the only role noise has when you're dealing with quantum mechanical system is just making things boring, separable, and thermalized. Mm -hmm. So here's our hope to give some surprise to the audience. Okay. So I forget now <coughs> about entanglement and I focus on the problem that is going to be the, the topic for the rest of the talk. I'm going to analyze how does energy or excitations propagate across the quantum network. First I will do a discussion, entirely abstract. And then what I would argue is that the fundamental principles that we can unveil in this abstract scenario for having a noise system process can later be applied to situations where we are analyzing how the light <coughs> migrate from one region to another. And in particular, we will analyze a biological system that is an essential ingredient in, in, in photosynthetic activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so imagine a network like that, where now, to the formalism I briefly wrote at the beginning, I just explicitly write down what is the form of the coupling Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So I allow for excitations. Imagine that we inject one in qubit number one to propagate across this network via this exchange interaction. In principle, I would allow that any selected node, J, is connected with any other L. The two things analytically, I would have to impose some constraints. So everything is Hamiltonian except one final step. What I will assume is that there is a privileged node somewhere such that the connection of this red trapping side 
to a site N is irreversible. So the population which is known is trapped there forever and will not be fed back into the network. Mm -hmm. So that process in red will be described by the medium of that form. And the question we want to answer is, if I give you a time t, how much of the energy that was injected inside one has been transferred to the side? Well, if you allow me to make things a little bit simpler and say that all the coupling strengths are the same, then we can do things analytically and give an expression for what is the asymptotic rate of population transfer to the sink. Sorry. And here you have it. You see that it's extremely inefficient with the number of sites. So for something as moderate as seven sites, you see that the probability that the excitation has reached the trapping site is 16.6%. So if the Hamiltonian is what is dictating what is going on, if the evolution is coherent, then sending excitations through a network like one we wrote would be very bad for doing any type of transport. So we're going to discuss whether adding noise is or is not a good idea. And you can already imagine that we have reasons to believe that it will. Even thinking in a purely classical setup, if you think yes of a typical donor receptor system, we know that the transfer rate can be enhanced by any noise mechanism that will help you to reach energy gaps, so that is responsible for some sort of line problem. So this is a well-known effect that appears in foster transfer. In addition, we have a, a canonical process in, in quantum mechanics telling us that there is an intimate link between transport of noise if we think of noise in terms of disorder and thus Anderson localization and the many other castings of the process. Okay? So let's see how we would formulate things here in the context of, of these abstract networks. Well, the first thing I have to do is to choose a theoretical model. Mm -hmm. For reasons that will be clear later, I will abandon the foster regime where I could just treat the coupling between sides perturbatively. And I will focus for the moment, eh, later we'll see more sophisticated treatments, I will focus now on the case where the interaction with the environment can be traced out, trade the coupling electron environment in a perturbative way, and then we will derive a dynamics, a reduced dynamics for the evolution of the system. For those of you that come from Condens Mata, you will be thinking about with the description instead of logarithmic equations. Quantum optics, we like the evolution to also not be only trace preserving but completely positive and we keep for the moment with a limited approach. We now call it limited Kosakovsky for Alexandra's influence and therefore from the, the school of the lab. He's getting his money. He's getting, I think there is a third one that should be there, no? Yes. Yeah, who is? Well, there are two Italians. Vigerio and Guri. Okay, it's becoming a little bit long. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, for the moment, even also that Kosakovsky is a very nice guy, we keep it. So, leave that Kosakovsky. <laughs> and this is the first noise model that we will be considering. So, both realization and dissipation will be described by Eubelius of this canonical form where the class operators will be a sigma set in the case of defacing. Don't like this thing. Maybe go. Yeah, I'm going backwards. Okay, I think this is probably known by everybody. So this is the first 
approach that we consider. Eh? I would assume that every site in the network is subject to these two independent sources of information. Is that equal zero for the equation or this? Yes, but in proof and everything will get a little bit done. But in order to illustrate the principles, it will be enough. You will actually be surprised at how robust it is. But indeed, just to make things simpler, what would be the first thing you would write down? So if you want, the, the defacing part is the equivalent to what the people in condensed matter call the infinite temperature, Hutton stroke model, right? And for the dissipated part, I do put it uh, at zero T because actually I will have optical transition, so that's going to be small contribution. Okay? When you, you, so when you talk about the network, you are still in the fully connected situation. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. You can argue how close is the reality to do a reduced description with this form that we know that implies a weak coupling and an environment that is responding very, very fast. This is another issue that we will analyze in the second part of the talk. Okay, so if you do the computation of the same transfer to the, our trapping node, you will encounter that what initially was only 16%, you see that by means of adding just local defacing or by means of disorder in the network is now allowing you to reach the regime where you can effectively transfer all the population to the city. Hmm? Again, in the case of fully connected networks, we can leave analytical expressions. <coughs> so what is going on? Well, I think in a way I'm, I'm telling you the story, probably... Capital D in the previous transparency uh, yeah. stands for... Is that is the number of disordered um, sites? So for right. you, a disordered in a fully connected network? Okay, sorry, well, I'm abusing the notation, the, the, the wording. Let's say I keep it fully connected in the sense that the cutting strength is the same, right? But now I allow the energies of the different sides to be different. This is the only thing I need. If you want to remove the so the links, the links remain all the same, but the nodes of the network change. Exactly. The, the, so so the, the, the values of them. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. The structure of the eigenvalues will change completely, and this is precisely what is going to make the transfer now possible, as you will see in a moment. Actually, I take the opportunity to comment two things here. You see that asymptotically, both introducing disorder or beauty facing have the same effect of allowing you to faithfully transmit. But you see that the rate at which they do within this model is less effective in the case of simply sorting the energies, right? Introducing beauty placing allows you to do the job faster. Okay. So then what we're gonna try is to really build into small pieces what is going on because we have to have very clear what the fundamental mechanisms are in order to later apply them in a, in, in a context that is quite complicated and where we expect that these fundamental things we get is made about. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is that what noise will allow us to do is to access, if you want, the trap inside by a box that previously were forbidden. Because previously we had a Hamiltonian evolution, interfering effects, and typically it made paths that were convenient for us to reach the trap inside, but were simply forbidden, given that we have to make probability amplitudes to interfere. So then the two mechanisms that will allow noise to assist the transport of, of excitation are eliminating that possibility by means of removing destructive interference and, in addition, aiding energetic 
typically unfavorable transitions by means of increasing the line of the, by broadening the line. The most Mickey Mouse picture, but maybe you have already guessing. Well, imagine that the initial part of the Hamiltonian with gas is the localizing of the excitation between side one and two in such a way that you create a single state between spin one and spin two, right? If they are connected to a sink in such a way that the probability amplitudes are the same, here you are. Typical textbook situation to illustrate that only 50% of the population will be transferred. So what you need is to have a dynamics that will take you out of that loop, right? So what you need is some form of defacing noise. In the moment that you remove this condition for exact cancellation and therefore leaving forever the localized in that side, then the transfer efficiency will increase. Hmm? So this initial very quick 50% goes off, corresponds to the part of the initial superposition that was connected to the reaction center, and now by means of noise, what you've done is liberating the other but, but if you destroy the destructive interference, you also are degrading the constructive interference. So why it remains correlation at the quantum level? You have to be patient and wait a little bit, right? So this is a failing thing that will be unveiling step by step. Mm -hmm. But we are almost there. And I think this is the formalization of what you were already visualizing before. If you give me a Hamiltonian, what we can do is give you a structure onto invariant subspaces where excitations will be trapped. So you will immediately be able to characterize how good that network is from the point of view of, of transferring energy. Mm -hmm. If you want to see details, this is some work we published in last year in the Journal of Chemical Physics. And I think it's nice. I mean, it, it formalizes um, I think ideas that well, everybody knows that like broadening can exist, that's right. But here in a systematic way, you can identify the invariant subspaces of whatever network you want, right? And therefore see what sort of noise engineering you would need to do in order to convert your initially back network into a transporting. What is the behavior of the probability of transferring the excitation successfully as a function of the noise strength characterized by this parameter gamma? Well, at the beginning, when you start to increase what is the value of gamma, you have this reduction of destructive interference, and therefore, you start to transmit efficiently, efficiently towards the scene reach a plateau and then if you carry on again you have a, a localization effect, a zero effect if you want. What is interesting is that you realize that this behavior up here where the transfer is essentially perfect is very broad. So you don't need to tune your noise very very fine in the sense that it has to be 0.78 for the excitation to go through, which is something that one can imagine that if nature was done quantum mechanical calculations to see how the defaces should go, it has to create something that is reasonably robust. The same applies if you modify the Hamiltonian, yeah, if you change the values of the parameters and then we compare the optimal values of the noise, we will have something very basic. Okay, so let us now try to apply these very fundamental ideas to a, a system that does exist in nature. Hmm? For one of these things that somehow happens in physics, this is work that we did, the first paper in 2008, 
and totally independent. We've never heard of Alam before on the other side of the Atlantic in the mountains. A very, very similar approach. So the system we're going to be paying attention with is, is in a cartoon-like represented here. This is the so-called Fena Matthew also complex, which appears in, in a type of photosynthetic bacteria, in particular in the green sulfur one, that is particularly adapted to work efficiently under very, very extreme-like conditions. So the FMO is, they call it a pigment protein complex, and it's actually a trimer. It is disputed at the moment, but it seems that these trimers are independent. Eh? Either one works or another, but there's essentially no interaction between the three. Each of them is made up of, for us, seven sites. In reality, these are seven these pigments, are seven bacterial chlorophyll molecules that are embedded in this protein scaffolding. But as you see, this is definitely, we were discussing yesterday, this is a complex system. For me, this is probably an example, a um, scary one. And a reason why I think it's <coughs> the idea that quantum mechanics may be relevant to this context may be is, is justified. But we will argue that for excitation transfer, it may not be the case. What is going to be relevant is the orientation of these pigments. 2009, it was clear experimental results showing that that's the case, that number one and number six are the ones that are close to this reception center where light is absorbed, and the ones that are facing the reaction center are number four and number three. So the FMO, but this is, is, is a sort of molecular wire between the antenna and the final destination. Once the excitation is transferred there, some charge some electric radiant will, will be created and all sorts of chemical reactions will, will start. Well, it's well known that this, this is done very, very efficiently so that every photon that is captured here goes to the reaction center on a time scale of a few seconds. So this may be hot and wet and whatever you want to call it, but it transfer excitations very, very efficiently. So how is it done? This, this has puzzled people for many years. And uh, I've never seen the original reference myself, but it, I think it was Perrin already, uh, close to the initial development of quantum mechanics that argue that quite likely light is transferred in photosynthesis by means of a, of a localized wave, rather than by just migrating, hopping by a foster process from, from pigment to pigment. Hmm? Okay. So the experimental evidence that that's not the case is very recent and is linked to the development of new spectroscopic techniques that are operative in the femtosecond regime. I think well, this is the, the first experiments were done in the, in the group of Graham Fleming. I think this is 2007. There were some previous indications, but let's say this is the, the work by Engel is now the reference that everybody quotes as a first clear cut demonstration of halogen temperatures. And just this year, now Greg in Chicago has shown that also at physiological temperatures, the description that a rate equation dynamics will provide is not compatible with what they observe. If observe eating between excitons that cannot just be explained if coherent in absence. Mm. Okay. So can our Mickey Mouse model be helpful to understand what is going on? Well let us try to do it just with the even with the very academic noise model we had at the beginning. FMO was the first big protein complex to be sorted out spectroscopically. So there are variations, and actually FMO can appear in two different 
different types of bacteria, but let's say we can believe this form of the Hamiltonian, let's say plus minus okay, 15%. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is to use that form of the Hamiltonian for the coherent part of the evolution. And I will continue modeling interfacing on the laws of excitation with, with my Lindblad-Kosakowski approach. And this is what we get. If the Hamiltonian I've just showed you would be the only thing important in the dynamics, then in a time of 5 picoseconds, no more than 60% of the population would be transferred to the city. Well, this is not what is of certain nature, so definitely, if quantum mechanics is present, it's not alone. If quantum mechanics is absent, experiments cannot be well described either, so then we are forced to admit that the process is noise assisted. Well, here you can see what happens if we start to increase the value of our local defensive rate. And also, we did an optimization to see that you just get numerically what are the, the local decay rates we should have in order to, to account for. So why is noise helping us now in a in a network that definitely will not fit within the initial description. The only of that you consider just classical coding. Yeah. What would I obtain is that I cannot account for the exit on eating that experimental is not observed. So, the so of course, ah, if you want to start a company of artificial solar cells and you tell me do I have to enroll in quantum mechanics one? I will tell you not necessarily you can also engineer for excitations to migrate, okay, by thermal hopping only. The point is that is there any reason why having a Hamiltonian dynamics, quantum mechanics, is advantageous from a functional point of view? Well, this is a big question. And I will elaborate a little bit more on that in a moment. No, but what I mean is that you find that by increasing the defacing, mm -hmm. you have more transport, right? Yes. So you are, you are working with a little bit No, no, but take into account that I'm, I'm also able to do more. Here I'm plotting and uh, I'm <coughs> merit because I was arguing in terms of transport. But I can also account for the time evolution of the system and I could try to reproduce the two-dimensional spectroscopy these guys measure. This is what you would be able to do with, with your rate equation approach. Okay? Yes or no? No, it's, it's very, maybe a very nice uh, interpretation. So if you increase the effect, you have a linear master equation, your diagonal elements become the couple from the non-diagonal elements in the in the in the system. Yes, so if you increase the diagonal elements, you become the couple from the non-diagonal elements in the system. Yes, so if you increase the diagonal elements, you become the couple from the non-diagonal elements in the system. Yes, so if you increase the diagonal elements, you become the couple from the non-diagonal elements in the system. Yes, so if you increase the diagonal elements, you become the couple three orders of magnitude But we can see the thing quite graphically what is going on even in, in FMO. Hmm? In Filippo we will we'll show you some, some simulations later. But essentially the, the level structure of the system is what I've tried to depict in here. There is a strong coupling between the nodes Number one, that is the one that we side, that receives the excitation and node number two, side two. So a good idea is to use now a hybrid basis of states plus and minus that are simply equally weighted superpositions of sides one and two. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that now states plus and minus are decoupled, but unfortunately, unfortunately side states hybrid state minus is strongly coupled to the other parts of the molecule 
that would provide a very slow path. So that's why initially 50% of the population is transmitted very quickly because state plus is connected with three, that it goes to the sink. But we have this inconvenient path where the Hamiltonian dynamics con confines you to oscillate back and forth. So what noise is doing now in actual FMO is minimizing the weight of that, opening up an incoherent channel from state minus to the cable into plus, and then flip, off it goes down to the sink. Mm -hmm. You can read it in more detail in, in the analysis we presented recently, but I think this way of looking at it, well, from my point of view, is much more transparent than a description in terms of exitons and arguing that, okay, different exitons have a small hole up with a reaction center, and therefore the transport has been narcissistic. Fair enough, but how? I think you would really see how this actually happened. Mm -hmm. It would be, if you put everything on top, it may be perhaps a little bit more complex, but the fundamental features can be understood as simply as that. Again, I insist on the fact of the robustness that the small variations, even in the noise model, as you will see, in the decay and the phasing rates, even in the value of the Europa Hamiltonians and the public strengths, does not matter. It shows that in the presence of a system that is by construction very robust to small fluctuations, as one would think that it should be. Hmm? If there is any chemical physicists or condensed matter, one can say, okay, fine, it's very nice to read with your limbled formalism, but it's quite unlikely that this is an accurate description of what is really going on in this type of biological systems. And that's the case. Remember that FOSTA would work very well if this interaction with the surrounding protein environment dominates, <coughs> and in the opposite case, our master equation approach would be very good if really the electronic coupling is much larger than the coupling to the environment. But the indications is that the real system sits very uncomfortably in between. So using approximate perturbative techniques is definitely not justified. The order of magnitude of the coupling to the surroundings is of the same order as the electronic coupling. So this is an arena where we should try to use numerical exact methods. But this is the other issue we've been dealing with. All the details of what's happening, if you allow me to use this as picture and say, I imagine whatever is around this, this funny protein that is providing me with the, the phononic environment that we interrupt my excitations, details concerning the spectral density and the microscopic details of the interaction are unknown, which is another reason why this is an interesting arena to play, because little is known. Mm -hmm. What is known is that it's an environment that most likely will react slowly, so not very good for any Markovian type of approach. Okay, so what we've done is how am I doing? Robert, <laughs> I speak very slowly. <laughs> okay, is there any people working in uh, TDMRG or so in the, in the audience? No. Well, but everybody knows the spin boson model. Hmm? The spin boson model, if you want to solve it exactly, is not exactly computer friendly. So there are ways to transform it into a, something that it is, which is having our spin coupled to a semi-infinite chain 
that has the property that only nearest neighbors talk to each other, and that can be simulated efficiently. So what we've done, and now I will run a little bit, is to develop a new method that is able to provide you either analytically or by means of a numerical <coughs> state of procedures, the way to do the mapping from a spin boson to a linear chain. The advantage of this is that we have a method where we can simulate the dynamics of any funny spectral density you want to give me, including spectral densities that are highly inconvenient for our numerical methods. So those are the ones that may be very good at a certain frequency. But there is some experimental evidence that in the very local surroundings, the pigments may be seen across the person that know it. So we wanted to see how does this affect the dynamics and done the simulation of what would be, well, the building block of anything that would be just having a dimer system. So we've mapped the dimer into something that can be simulated efficiently, and by that I mean that the error we do is bounded and accessible, and see what type of dynamics you can have. Okay, the point is that maybe I may have a model that reproduces the transfer time and the efficiency of the transfer, and according to the experiments, David can have his given with the equations. But the point is that now when we look at the dynamics, differences will arise. Well, the presence of these high frequency modes would alter the pattern significantly. Mm -hmm. So, in particular, this type of techniques would allow us to compute, once we've stemmed it to seven nodes, 2D, the spectroscopy diagrams that could be compared with experimentalists and try to gauge further information about what is going on. And in particular, what is exactly the role of the environment? Because despite here, you could, for instance, use recently developed measures to quantify how normal polyan evolution is, and you could get that indeed it is. If the coupling to the environment is of the defacing type, so that the populations are conserved, what happens is that for a dima, if we are confined to the one excitation sector, then if you would prepare the dima in the identity matrix initially, nothing will happen. You would agree that if I only have one excitation, this dima is equivalent to a qubit system. Well, with a, the evolution of a qubit system preserves the identity matrix, you say that is unitary, and it has the property, and this is an if and only if condition, that if the qubit evolution is unitary, it can be decomposed in a sequence, in a complex sum of random unitaries. So this means that no matter how funny this evolution is, I could fabricate a classical environment where there will be a little normal with a list of P's and a list of U's, and he will be able to link this. So the question, one of the questions that arises is, is this, is this necessary that the environment is really wonderful? Could one actually do equally well the job with a classical oscillating field of some sort? Well, just this morning I got results for what would be the simulation of a trimer. In the case of a trimer, what we can show is that this decomposition in terms of random unitaries does not exist. So there is an element of quantumness in the environment itself. But given that the description of all this is so inaccurate at the experimental level, it can also be that with a classical environment we can still do the job within the error bars. And that would be very useful because it's much easier to simulate a classical environment than a quantum one. Or not, or maybe that's not possible at all. And then 
the majority will have very little escape for not joining the course because it's not only the Hamiltonian part, it's also the surroundings which is, if you want, an additional element of, of quantumness. So I conclude with many questions that um, in the next talk, may, Filippo will, will provide you some, some clues or at least how, how we think the problem or some of the problems will be addressed. And essentially, okay, we've analyzed photosynthesis, but uh, it may be other processes where indeed one could find evidence of quantum coherence. Transport across ion channels is, is one people have speculated at all for many years. What is the role of coherence is unclear. I mean, I think we could also argue that it's simply the byproduct of exploring the dynamics of the femtosecond scale. Is it more sophisticated than that? Is there any reason in the, in the functional way biologists use this word, while it's more convenient to build this structure so that they exploit quantum features? How do we really quantify them? And moreover, how do we actually test these systems? It's very difficult to extract faithful information for all sorts of these spectroscopic techniques they use. So I just conclude, just showing you the group in Ulm that form us merge. I think we brought 20 people from the UK, the big group of Martin at Imperial College and mine at UH. We are all now all together in Germany. And here I've put the pictures of the people that have been, this has been a, a large collaborative work. So Filippo will give the talk after me. This is Alex Trump from the Smart Physics is from Cambridge, Uncle Rivas from Complutense Madrid, Robert Rosenbach is the person that is now extending the energy <coughs> code to final temperature. This is our TDMRG guy, Javier Prior, from the University of Cartagena, he did the simulations. Animus is now in Oxford. And Conrad Adenauer is the one that is checking whether it's possible to decompose the dynamical evolution into, into random Jupiters. I don't know whether you know what Ulm is, so I conclude with this. It's essentially equidistant between Stuttgart and, and Munich, and it's famous for, for the Munster, for the cathedral. Also, people know that Einstein was born there, but essentially was born there. <laughs> he didn't live there for long. And the funny thing is that when he was born, the cathedral looked very different, you see? That was when, born, when, when Einstein was around, this final spike had not been yet added. So to finalize, let me thank uh, Roberta and David for organizing the workshop. And I also take the opportunity to acknowledge Maxi San Miguel, for having created this center, which I think is really a reference for this country. So thanks, and so for the time. <laughs>
I'm trying to see whether the advantage is present in all of them. So I think that the fact that now there is experimental support has made a huge change. Well, what I'm trying to understand is, I mean, uh, the, the well, knowledge and understanding of photosynthesis is a very old thing. Exactly. But now, now what, what, what is new from the point of view of functionality? Oh, well, for functionality, I, I, I can only speculate, but now what is clear is that if I put them in front of them, all this collection of peaks, and tell them this is how the system behaves, they cannot sort it out. They are resorting to the foster machinery. So they have to agree that if they want to understand what is going on, they have something missing in the picture. For many years it was thought that FOSTA would do entirely the job, Well, now it seems that it's not. Now, the question I've already commented before, can we specifically link entanglement with the functionality and the perfect efficiency of these complexes? Not in the clear-cut way you would say you can only do quantum state teleportation if you have entanglement. If you don't have it, it is not possible. So a link as convincing like that, or as clear cut like that, is missing. It may be that we've not asked exactly the, the right question. But Filippo will later tell you other, other parts of the puzzles that, that may be helped. But indeed, I mean, many questions, a lot of work to do. But not enough time. Maybe we can continue with the coffee and just so um, if someone, some, if someone is interested at uh, maybe 20 to 5, because it's really <coughs> late, uh, there will be a presentation noise assisted transport in biological complex quantum network by Filippo Caruso. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susanna. <laughs>